So Thane. Yes. I put my jacket for you, Barb. You're looking very handsome as always, sir. Well, knowing I would see you, I prepared. Look at that sunlight shining you. right on you. It's like the wine gods knew uh, we would be together today. Yeah, he, yeah, I wish he had been with me over the last three months. <laughs> we need wine gods, as you said. <laughs> I think we all feel that way. Yeah, so have you um, done a lot of those in the last few weeks or month? Uh, we started this kind of thing uh, first or second week in April, and I'd say between wine and, um, you know, our spirits crew have been doing one or two a week as well. We've probably done a couple dozen, maybe. Great. Trying to keep it uh, creative, like this one today, because um, I find that most people have done, you know, a couple people on screen tasting wine, and that's fine, but this kind of thing is far more engaging and interesting, so well, I think it'll be fun. Yeah, we, we got to get you all excited. Are you going to get me? <laughs> I, it's my dream. It's been my dream for many years now, you know. But, but you allow me to dream. At least you let me dream. We're going to save that for the midnight showing. Barb, it's like that great girl. I was 60 years old. I was at school in D.C. And like you, gorgeous, irresistible bartender at a bar named Paper Moon in Washington, D.C., off M Street. And friends of mine, we were going just to pick up girls, obviously. And this lovely lady got rid of me so intelligently by offering me glasses of gin, 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 till I could not even speak and I collapsed. <laughs> and then I was so ashamed of myself, I never came back to the bar. <laughs> so she knew what she was doing. We, uh... I'm not sure who, but somehow we're uh, broadcasting now. So we have some people coming into the room joining us. We've got about a minute until we get started with the real show. Anybody who's joining us, uh, kind of hang tight. We're just finishing the final touches here. Welcome. I'm going to be able to hear from that. Yes. Well, we'll, we'll put it upstairs. I want to welcome everybody that's just coming in to the room. We're just taking about 30 seconds more here to get settled, and we're going to be broadcasting on Facebook. So hang tight. Hopefully you have a great glass of Cabernet poured. We're going to get to tasting it with Thane the winemaker and our friend Jean Charles in just about 20 to 30 seconds. Hang tight. Thanks.
We are in the heart of Napa Valley, Mark. You want to get started today, Jean-Charles, just giving us a preview of what the day was like. How's the weather? Is it super hot there? Well, it's phenomenally hot. We loving it because it's exactly what the grapes are needing. You know, this is a perfect time where we've had rain two weeks ago. Now we have beautiful weather. So the formation is fabulous of the flower coming in and the clusters are going to look great. It's going to be a beautiful harvest bar. Beautiful. You can, <laughs> you can tell already it's the beginning of June and you're predicting September? Well, it's, um, it's very easy because you go in the vineyards, you look at the leaf, you look at the formation of the cluster because you have a great idea of it now. You look at how many eyes there is, meaning on the cane, and you look at the overall health of the rootstocks. And I think in both Napa and Sonoma, we're blessed, really, really blessed, which we need to, as you could see the sun coming in my head, God is with us. So God would always be with us. <laughs> you have to sweat a little bit to make great wine. At That's least right, for a few weeks a year. <laughs> the timing so worked out well. Make the wine, Barb, and he's going to make you believe that it's a lot of work. And I stylized the wine with him, and I'm going to make you... That's the hard part of it, because that's when you actually bring the style of the wine together. Making it, you bring the grapes in, you let them ferment, the sugar converts into alcohol, you put them in a barrel, and there you wait. You just watch it, and magic happens. And Thane really isn't even needed in the whole process. The grapes just, it yeah, makes it itself. Because he has great spirituality. He's the priest of Oakville as well, because we're in the church of Oakville. Mm. You know, he is uh, the man who takes care of our children. He's the man who basically does it all, so we need him. <laughs> These are all my babies. Everybody needs one of those. So cheers, Thane and Jean-Charles. And the, those of you that are joining us here on Zoom, and I think we're streaming to Facebook, welcome. We've taken a couple weeks off here with everything that's been going on in Chicagoland and across the country, and we sure are glad everybody's safe uh, and doing pretty well. And we're glad to bring you back to some wine tasting virtually for now. And you'll see we're joined today by legendary and our old friend, Jean-Charles Boisset, who's responsible for multiple wineries across the world in France, England, of course, and throughout California, especially in Napa Valley. Today, we're talking about a couple of Napa Valley Cabernets that are newer to the Binnie's shells. That's 1881. And uh, this one here called Durant and Booth. And I think we're just gonna get started with a little cheers and a tasting and an introduction to this wine. And then um, you're going to take us on a tour of your new museum. Is that right, Jean-Charles? Absolutely. We're delighted. First of all, Barb, thank you immensely on the behalf of all of us in the wine country for doing those great tastings, for bringing us your wonderful guests and friends. So we're very honored with that. We're very appreciative of that because you need to realize it was lonely for you. The wine country has been deserted for three months. So when we see people, we want to talk to them, touch them, feel them. <laughs> Not that we can, but we thrilled to be able to be with many of your friends here in the Midwest. And we're cheering with our back of our fashion collection glass that we designed that is full of crystal. And this is a wine with a lot of energy. And Thane, our fabulous winemaker, will explain it. But I first want to tell you why Durant and Booth. Barb, you're wearing a beautiful blue dress. Thank oh, thank you. you. This is the official color, historically, of the Durant and Booth family. And as you could see on this packaging, this is a very, very important historical name in the Napa Valley. We are in it right now. And we're going to show you the house and give you a full tour live. This is one of the oldest Victorian houses north of Napa, in the heart of Oakville, that was actually built in 1877 by Mr. Durant and Mr. Booth. Hence the name Durant and Booth. 
And those two families, Barb, created a very historical store. And I know you love stores. Obviously, Beanies are very good friends and phenomenal stores. They created the first retail of wine provision in Napa Valley called the Oakville Grocery. And this is very iconic because obviously it's the most visited store on the West Coast. We receive over 250,000 people every year stopping for pizza or sandwich, provision, mustards, and um, you know prepared foods and coffees and beers and wine. And this is very exciting, Barb, to talk about this wine because of what you love as well, which is all history, all the identity of the United States, the personality of the US, and truthfully, you know, the taste of Napa Valley. So what we're having in our glass is a true Cabernet Sauvignon from the heart of Napa. And I would love for you to tell us what you sense on the wine and then Payne to tell us all about how he made the wine. Oh, absolutely. What, little, what do you like? A little about show that? and tell thing. Mm. I, I really appreciate Jean Charles' word energy for this. Uh, I've had mine open for about an hour now, and I will admit and remind our viewers, as I do often, I put a tiny chill on it. This room temperature cab for me just uh, doesn't have enough oomph. So tiny chill, I opened it about an hour ago, but my very first uh, impression was it's very smooth. It's super approachable, um, user-friendly, and while it has really nice structure, it's not drying me out with tannins. Um, and again, I really do like the word energy. The acidity is there, it has a nice Thank width. You. There's a raspberry and sort of current, almost cranberry note to it. But for Napa Valley Cabernet, I think it's wonderfully approachable. Well, I, thank you. And that was really our goal, Barb. Good. You, make it you did it. it without being overly powering. You so, Thane, how, how did you do that? Thing, right? I, I think of yeah. this cab as being like the gateway drug for Napa cabs. It is just the prime example for the gateway to the Napa Valley to have this cab is like, really brings you to the table and showcases Napa Cab in a Did way Did you call it the gateway drug? The gateway drug to Ooh, Napa Cab. That's going to be my next expression. I like that. You know, you know we can open... He's going to make a new label now. A <laughs> new label. Well, we can open, as you probably know, cannabis uh, dispensers in most of the small towns of Northern California. So Angel, I like the idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's legal here now too, JCB. There you go. This is the gateway drug to our next wine. But th this is just a fantastic value and just couldn't couldn't be a better offering for Napa Cab to showcase all the things you get in Napa that you just mentioned, like that, that fruit bouquet and just all the juice, juicy fruit that you get out of, the, out of the glass, but it's still anchored with a lot of estate fruit and Rutherford that gives it a lot of wonderful structure and body that really gives you a full, full introduction for Napa Cab. It's, really a fantastic and, and yeah gateway drug to the Napa Valley you know it, it's all of it I in do, one package. I do agree with that I think it's somehow writing a line between um the Napa Cab but also something that would be good for people who think maybe they don't like Cab because it's too dry right. they hear that a lot they just they yes. don't want a lot of oaky tannin or dusty tannin um so the smoothness of this the round edges I think this is a great Cabernet for people who typically like Merlot or um, Pinot Noir or maybe um, even Zinfandel because it's very fruit forward and juicy, but still has that nice Napa structure. So I think it's really well done. Did you say most of the fruit comes from Rutherford then? It's mostly center of the valley. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of that rich fruit expression that comes from valley floor fruit. And in Napa Valley, that's where you're really getting a lot of your sweet, rich, uh, things like you mentioned, currants and, uh, and boysenberry characters come from that area of the valley. And it's very appropriate for this package and goes along with the label as well. When we're coming up with the brand and, and wine, we really want it to tell the story of what's in the bottle. And uh, choosing fruit from those areas really speaks to the bottle as well. Cool. Thane, I think we're gonna circle back to you 
a little bit later right. and we'll talk about 1881, but I know we're all eager uh, to see the museum and hopefully Jean-Charles, you can tell us about how you acquired it. Um, Absolutely. But be before so, you head upstairs, uh, I have to ask, because we've already through. had- so We're gonna have Dylan, our wonderful digital oh, guru, who's gonna to follow us with his phone. So now we're gonna transit to the other camera. And Thane is going to grab the line, so we'll be great. It's, so, Jean Charles, has this always been your dream to have like two cameras on you at all times? Well, absolutely. Uh, I did, ideally, three <laughs> one on the top, one under, and one on the side. But I'll do it you with always, two. You always have to be the center of attention. We know it's fine. All right, so. Uh, folks that maybe aren't familiar with 1881, the museum, Jean-Charles, you bought this property and you opened this museum about a year ago, is that right? Exactly, and I want to show you, basically, I'm just taking over the phone for a second. I want to show you the whole idea of this amazing place. So from the moment you arrive, you are welcome over here into this incredible place. So this is Dylan and obviously Thane. So you could see, we welcome you here, and it's called 1881. And you welcome with an amazing collection of tools that we created a chandelier. All the tools that we've been collecting, my sister and I, for the last really 40 years, we've bought in auctions and in all kinds of places all over the world. And we have two major museums in the US, one at Buena Vista Winery, and one here at 1881. And I mentioned that to you because we believe it's so important to have the history of California. So why? Because in many ways, California is an incredible place, which thanks to Thomas Jefferson Big saying, remember, we will be a country if we stretch from one ocean to the other. And California was missing. So next to Buena Vista, 10 miles away from where we are, you basically had something very unique happened. Back in 1846, you had what we call the Burr Flag Republic. And in 1846, the independence to Mexico, in 1850, the joining to the US. And that became a strategic moment and really California became her own, attached to the US, and really started to very strongly develop fine wines. And this is at the time where Buena Vista started, as you know, first California winery, and as well at the time where those people, Mr. Duran and Mr. Booth, created this amazing house. So as you come into the museum, you can see you welcome with an amazing chandelier from the 19th century, of course, Baccarat, and you are dazzled by a map. Do you see it, Barb? The map of 1895. And what we wanted is dive into the history. And as you come in for this experience, you discover wine from 50 different producers by the glass, and as well, a key explanation of each of the AVA. As an example, we go very deep into what is San Lina, facts and notable moments. Then we go into planted acres, climate, elevation, soil, leading grapes. And this is very important for us, Barb, to become the educator of wine in Napa Valley. So for that reason, and for all our guests today, we created this amazing history of Napa Valley. And this is a book about the history of every AVA in the heart of Napa and soil. So as you taste wine and you look at magnificent objects, and I'm gonna walk you through each of them, you discover the whole idea of what is decanting, carafing, enjoying great wines, tasting, and the history of it. So I'm gonna take you now through the upstairs. 
You can see, by the way, all those great products, uh, all the new products and their own brand of Oakville Grocery, from olive oil to mustard to honey to tapenade to everything else. But um, as we go up, and Barb, I'm sorry. Yeah, you were going to say? I was just going to ask our group uh, that's joining us here on Zoom, how many of them maybe have been to Oakville Grocery and kind of know the legendary stop? I know I go there once or twice every time I go to Napa. It is such a, a landmark along 29 there. I know Scott Cohen is with us today and he took me there once on a trip. So hello and thanks to Scott. But go ahead and let us know in chat. Uh, folks, if you're drinking one of these two cabs tonight, or if you've been to Oakville Grocery or been to the museum yet, but I just really want to make sure people feel free to um, ask you questions or, or chat here tonight. Anyway, I'm excited to see what's upstairs. Well, thank you. Well, and I love it because as many people say, it's my first stop. It's very true. It's everybody's stop. You do a tasting, you want to take a break, you want to have a beer or soft drinks that's here. Now we have all those wine by the glass, so people come in. But what no one has really seen yet in a big way is this museum. So all from 1861 and even 35, Vallejo, who got the independence to Mexico, started his own winery, but very luckily inspired Buena Vista and obviously the Count of Buena Vista right here. And this was really the beginning, if you wish, of winemaking in California in 1857 by this man. Let's not forget as well that Napa Valley has been around for many, many centuries. And the history of Napa Valley is here. And Barb, this is the most important map. And it will become one of our soon. We're going to launch it in September. That's where I live in Napa Valley, it's called Wapo Hill. The old map was not called Napa Valley, pre-1826. It was called the Wapo Territory. So you had East, West, North, South, Wapo. So very cool, the Wapo Indians really identified the sites. And this is what we're explaining here and really created somehow this amazing soil that is what we have today. This is the land post-1846, changed name from the Wapo names to Rancho Camus, to Trancas, to La, you know, Loco Alomi, Carne Humana, Taculata, Malucamas. You can see those names. Then they change again to become the AVA you know. So this is from 1821 to 1846. I insist on that because a lot of people tend to forget this. So Charles Crew, you know, worked at Buena Vista for many years, for four years, and then he really wanted to start his winery. So the Count gave him the, his press and said, go to Napa Valley and start your own winery. The rest is history. He went to Yonville and San Lina and started, you know, the winery. You know, in 1841 as well, Bale was granted 18,000 acres and it was Carne Humana, Rancho Carne Humana, and it became obviously very famous and it is today San Lina. So, you know, there's a lot of history. Mr. Coombs, one of my favorite men, you know, he was born in Massachusetts. He came here with a dream and he really did it. He created what is today called Coombsville. You know, and then you know, we go on and on, as you can see, Barb, we're going up here, and you probably know Wild Horse as well, very interesting valley and great wines. Oak Knoll, founded by Mr. George Goodman, and you know, one of the first winery right here in the history of 1859, Osborne co-founded the Sonoma Napa Wine Company, then Rutherford. So we explain in thorough details, as you can see, the whole history. So, uh, you know, there's no way for you when you come here that you don't leave knowing the history of Napa if you're interested. Look at Stag's Leap, you know, 
John Grisby Brothers started Occidental Winery in 1878, the first winery in Stag's Leap, at the foot of Wapo Hill. Yonville, a great man, Mr. Yont, who received the Rancho Camus land, you know, very, very cool guy, obviously, created something quite amazing. Now I go up and then we'll see the tools, but I wanted to give everybody a little bit of a perspective of, of how interesting this is because, you know, we think we know Napa and Barb, you know, I came from Burgundy. That's where most of our wineries are. I came here, I wanted to know the history. There was nothing except the book from Charles Sullivan, which is the history of Napa. So we worked with Charles to create this museum. You can see here the great founders of Napa Valley. You have, you know, the big activists from Mr. Crane to Mr. Krug to Mr. Scheffler, you know, great businessman who really, and on the far right, Mr. Henry Pellet, French guy. You know, the French came but not really early on, you had a lot of Germans and Swiss people. You know, another German immigrant who founded Spring Mountain right here. And this beautiful winery, it was called Charles, his name is Charles Lem. You know, and Howell Mountain, another great area. You see, so the Chicago Herald, to talk about your beautiful newspaper, the wine king of the Pacific Slope. That was Mr. Crab, who founded Tocalo Vineyards, which happens to be right here. In front of us is the most expensive vineyards in the United States, Tocalo. So we really own the parcel of Opus One and Mondavi. I want to show you as well a great lady, Mrs. Nicolini, who founded Charles Valley. You see, a woman was very influential at the time as well in 1890 and then finally mr charles and then the famous diamond mountain and you know it well because it was mr jacob schramm again a german immigrant that really dreamt of the history of napa valley and finally if we go up valley the last aba you have you know which sits at the base or the most interesting volcano is Mount St. Helena is a town named Calistoga. And you could see Calistoga is actually my favorite man founded Calistoga. So if you ask me, who do you want to be? I would tell you, I would want to be Sam Brennan. That's him. He came from New York, you know, founded the hot springs founded the train of Napa, founded some of the best hillside vineyards. I should not say that bar, but he opened the first house of pleasure as well, which was very well known. No wonder he's your favorite. <laughs> and he really, I believe, link with the, the gold in mind, of course, because this was all post gold rush, but still minerals in mind. Really, the Sacramento Delta, you know, the bay all the way to Calistoga. And that's the view that you could see from it. So pretty amazing, huh? It really is such a beautiful spot. Can you stop for one more second and give folks another view out that front window of yours? Oh, for sure. Let me go and get you even a better view. And then better, we're going to taste the second wine. So now, basically, you're entering the museum. And this is a very artistic way to present to you shears. That's the Oakville Grocery. Many people know it. We've totally redone all the outdoors, all the great seatings, pizza oven, hamburger area, French fries, of course. But then I want to show you. Now, Barb, look at this. So you wanted to see Tocalon Vineyards? The best view of Tocalon Vineyards in Napa Valley is right here. You see it? That's not a bad office window, buddy. No. And then look at this one. Mount Santelina at the end. Wow. And then this is Opus One. 
And on the other side, I'm going to show you before we do the tour of the museum. Mondavi is right behind that tree. You could probably see the little tower of the Mondavi winery. And this is Spain. And this is, of course, Dylan. And this is that great map I was telling you about from 1895, right? And this is where we were downstairs. So this is kind of the perspective. I want to show you one more thing as we're looking outside. This is Opus One. Pretty cool, huh? That's pretty cool. I can't so believe they- uh... another wine. Maybe we want to try the other wine as I continue the tour. What do you think? I would love that. We've got the 1881 Nampa, of course, honoring the history and the museum that's here. So I'm going to ask Thane to describe this beautiful wine. So Thane, you can sit right there if you wish. Welcome back, Thane. Hi. Like interviewed by JC himself. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking good. He's yeah. turned the camera on you. Right? No, this is awesome. So for everybody, the next wine that we're tasting is the 1881 Napa Cab. So you can pop the cork and pour that one just now. Um, what I want to point out to this, what everything that we just reviewed and here all the way up the stairs and around, this wine is all about the history of Napa. It's right on the front, honoring Napa Valley's founders and history. And uh, when you come here and you taste the AVAs, you learn about the wine, what's different about the wine when it's grown in a specific place, who founded it, why they did that. Uh, it's really eye-opening for a lot of people to learn the differences throughout Napa Valley. And then to get to taste this one, it's really like if you had the gateway drug, uh, the Durant and Booth, you know, you're all working up towards this cab. And my glass is oh, empty, Thane. This oh, is no. not nice of you. This is the Cabernet that all baby grapes want to grow up to be right here. <laughs> Aspirational. It's really interesting. Aspirations of every grape. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have the two side by side. I'm not sure how many people that are watching with us may do the same, but even just the color. Um, mm -hmm. I've had a chance to enjoy how different these two Cabernets are, but even just the way they look in the glass is different. Um, but what really struck me is the bouquet is so pronounced in this 1881. It's really beautiful. Uh, I got a lot of like floral note, almost perfumed flowers in a way. Mm. Really beautiful and fruit. I love the raspberry. It's a little more kind of brooding, darker, richer. Are these the, the same vines or older vines? How are, how are the two different? These are very unique vineyards for this one. And well, what you're picking up, what I would say is this has a lot of southerly fruit from the south of Napa Valley that gives you a lot of that floral, wonderful richness, plumminess, uh, with some eastern hillside fruit to give it some structure. But I think what is really unique about this wine and sets it apart from the rest and, and really from our entire entire portfolio is its inclusion of American oak. So uh, a lot of people familiar with wine are familiar with French oak, but when you're telling the story of uh, American heritage, California, settling here, starting grape growing, they didn't always have access to French oak or uh, they went to the hills and they harvested the trees there, the na native trees being uh, American oak or redwood trees, and that's what they fermented their wine in. And so we felt it really important to tell that story uh, with this wine and include American oak, which gives you a very unique aroma. It gives you this bourbon, uh, toasted vanilla sweetness that that's really pops off the nose, and you can really, really ca capture that that warmth of American oak. Uh, a lot of people think of American oak as being more herbaceous, but what we're doing with this oak is very unique and very tailored to this wine, which you're getting that, that richer character off the nose. Would you say that that's um, the main thing? I'm putting you on the spot a bit here with a different one of Jean-Charles' labels, but would you say that's the main difference between that and maybe the Raymond Cabernet? Very much. I mean, that, yeah. that sets it apart, right? It's 100% different because of that. Um, e even though the fruit has its own unique sourcing, which will give it its own character uh, and terroir, but 
that inclusion of oak and the way we season it and the way we include it in the wine makes it totally unique. I love it. I think you're right. The structure, I didn't realize that was from hillside grapes, but that makes sense. But it still has some approachable character, really nice, rich, ripe fruit, um, but still nice and juicy and lush and a great price for, you know, an everyday or maybe weekend bottle. But I think both these cabs are really wonderful and different in their own right. So that's nice to have siblings, so, right? So Jamie's asking the, one of your, our guests is asking the oak composition as far as the length and where the, the oak comes from? So being American oak, it's really sourced, you know, people are familiar with French uh, forests, uh, Allée, Bretrage, all these center of France forests, they're familiar with that when they're talking oak, but for American oak, it's really largely coming out of uh, Missouri and Illinois these days, so really close to you guys right now. Um, that, that's where they source a lot of this oak, it's just great weather to grow uh, very stable, very uh, well-grown uh, grown tree, and then harvest it, season it the right amount of time, toast it just the right way before it finds its way to our wine. Well, you guys have the grapes and we'll keep giving you the oak and we'll call it square. <laughs> <laughs> Thank because... you. And what is, what is interesting, Barb, is here, as you know, we're focusing 1881, whereas Duran and Booth is 1877. So 1877, the house we is in was built. 1881 is the actual foundation of the Oakville Grocery as well. So it plays for one another. One, they came from Europe. So we decided to use European oak as they were English and Irish. And the... No. Oh. Don't worry, folks, we have a backup plan if something like this were to happen. Hopefully, Julia is going to jump back in soon here. In the meantime, uh, I know some of you are drinking both of these, and feel free to use the chat function to talk about it a little bit. Uh, Jamie, I'm going to get to your question here in a second about other varietals being blended in. And Chris will talk about organic or biodynamic farming when Thane comes back. Here we are, just a little glitch. Thank goodness jean Charles back. They don't, they don't want to look at me at all. Folks, this is why we have contingency plans. Uh, the grapes are fantastic in the heart of Napa Valley, but the Wi-Fi, not so much. There we go. So you can hear me again, right? I can, thank goodness. Well, I wanted you to want me more. <laughs> the only way for that is I have to disappear for a while. We all missed you while you were away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Barb. I, I propose, if it's okay with you, sure. that we go back to showing you a little bit the museum upstairs, Please and do. then we can come back to the wine, of course. Love it. Yeah, so as you enter the museum, a very important part First, you could see it's a mezzanine, which makes it very, very nice. And the whole idea was to showcase for everybody the idea of the history from the Cooper. So this is all the tools that are being used to make barrels right here from the punch marker to the barrel hole maker to the Cooper's tool and here to the plane to the, you know, all the tools to make the barrels. Those are not torturous tools. They are the tools to make the uh, barrel for a spigot. The Cooper's tool as well, you know, to help the hoop to go around the barrel. This is a very cool axis to help form the barrel. This is sickles over here and the Cooper's template, those are 19th century Cooper's template. I remember buying those in an auction in Bordeaux. The plane as well, you know, to, uh, uh, to make the top and the bottom cover of the staves of the barrel. This is the axis to mount the barrels. So, by the way, this is the old hospital of Napa Valley, of Napa. Look at this beautiful building. 
sadly disappeared in, in one of the five fires way back. But you could see here uh, little tools to work the vineyards for pruning. You see how beautiful they are. Here, this is the stapler for the barrel hoops, you know, to tie them together. Here, this is a great collection of pruning shears. This is here a little scale, not to measure the level of gold, but to measure grapes. Because in Europe, in the old days, similar to other crops, the people were paid by the amount of crops they would bring back from the end of the row, not by the hour. This is, I love this, this is an old copper sulfate prayer. Sprayer, look at how beautiful it is. And in the old days, we used to spray more copper sulfate and you would walk around, put that on your back and spray with this little cane. Pretty cool tool, huh? This one is a great one. Those are a lot of values these days in auction. This is a dispensive spigot. You put that at the bottom of your barrel or your vat and you get the juice. You know, this is really fun. This is how Napa Valley used to look when it was a lot more a polycultural type of area. And you could see obviously the harvest of different grains happening. This is a very exciting manual pump. So look at how gorgeous it is. It was used till 1926. I bought it personally, in fact, in Libourne, in Bordeaux. And it was at Lafitte Rothschild. You see, it has even Libourne written on it. And I put it right in front of Opus One, which is Mouton Rothschild, so they could talk to each other. <laughs> This is a pomace cutter. Barb, you can see those beautiful tools. Quite amazing. Huh? Very hard to find these days. So if anybody do find them, let us know. I want to show you this little bottle conveyor. All done by hand. You can see filled and then you measure the level and then you cork it. This is another copper sulfate cane. This is a sheer collection. Those Many people would be interested in those. They cost a fortune these days. They used to inject the insecticides into the soil and they were used pre phylloxera You know, America helped the French again back in 1896. What's new, right? Without America, we couldn't do anything still today. And those were injectors in order to try to treat the rootstock and the soil and the root. Very interesting syringe, right? It's scary. Copper, you know, another copper sprayer. So we use those. I saw those being used in the 80s. Uh, when I was younger, raising burgundy, some people were still using those. By the way, look at this view. I think so I saw clouds, a congressman. Though. I didn't I, think they allowed clouds in California. <laughs> Well, those are the beautiful, the beautiful clouds bringing a little wind and freshness to the grape, gently caressing their skin. Jean-Charles, so if you don't mind, just because you brought up uh, spraying and pesticides, we did have a question a little bit earlier about organic and biodynamic farming. Can you talk about that or do you want Thane maybe to talk about that when we get back? Well, I'll start and... Um, and, uh, and I know it's a passion of yours. Uh, my total passion. Uh, it's my passion forever. So basically, we've been a sustainable farmer forever. And we started to move into organic, really in Burgundy, in 1997, 1998. My sister and I were passionate about it. So we started with our own estate, Domaine de la Vougeray. It became an incredible success. And basically, what does it mean? No pesticides, no herbicides, no synthetic products. Then we moved into biodynamic farming, which is the most interesting. And as you know, biodynamic farming is all about following the lunar calendar and the cycle of the moon, the sun, and the earth together. So we're very solar and very lunar, and we do biodynamic preps to treat the vineyards. So no more at Raymond Vineyards, Buena Vista, 
the Loach, 1881, no more synthetic products. So it's a big deal with the largest producer today of organic and biodynamically certified vineyards in Napa Valley and in Burgundy. And we're very proud of it because we really believe that nothing that we don't know should be in that glass of wine. Therefore, we make very pure wine, delectable wines, and the wines that really represent, you know, the terroir, as we say. Maybe Thane wants to add something. Sure. You know, when people think about organic and biodynamic, it, biodynamic's new for a lot of people. It's not tangible, like organic. America understands that. Don't use this, don't use that, no synthetics. That's very easy to understand. But when you take it a step further to biodynamics, to me, what I, I taste, what I feel in the vineyard, it's bringing a, a tool set back to the viticulturist, a way to help bring life to the soil, a way to control pests in the vineyard, but in, in a way that like probiotics work. So you can use these teas, spray them back in the vineyard on the soils and bring life back to the ground and things that have been stripped there from traditional farming. Uh, I, that's really where biodynamic is for me. Exactly, and on May 12, if you wanna look at my uh, Instagram, I was actually doing a biodynamic prep, the 500, which I love, because in May, in the spring, you take what you had put in the soil, the horns, in October. So basically six months later, and you really connect the root to the air, the telluric energy to the cosmic energy, what happens below us to what's happening over us. And that's a very key moment in the history of biodynamic farming. The next one I'm doing is Friday. We're gonna do that live with Joe Papendik, who does all our preps. We're gonna do the 501, which basically connects certain plants to the preparation that Thane just referred. And then by hand, we basically spread in the vineyards. I need to tell you, Barb, I'm very proud. In 10 years, we've never used herbicides, pesticides over a 400 acre estate. And it has only been treated by yarrow, vervinia, nettle, horsetail, etc only pure plants and we only prevent. And that's the principle of biodynamic farming is working with the rhythm of mother nature and preventing. Very similar to homeopathy or very similar to Eastern medicine. I think it's, it's, you should be very proud of that. And I think it must be so rewarding. I've spoken to so many uh, winemakers and viticulturists and the truth is, look, nobody wants to spray their vineyards with pesticides or anything else, but sometimes people consider it sort of a necessary task for keeping, you know, the grapes in shape and preserving the integrity of the wine. So I think the fact that you're making as much wine as you are and making it so well uh, without any kind of synthetic material is really a testament to your commitment. And that's super cool. I hope people Thank understand you. how important and how unique that is, especially in California. So thanks for that and for keeping the earth safe for all of us. Well, thank you, Barb, and, and thank you as well for asking the question. Let's never forget the famous- That was from Chris, so thanks to Chris. Well, Chris, um, but to all of you, thank you for your interest because we are what we eat, as Bria Savarin said, and we are what we drink as well. And we got to drink well, we cannot drink 10 bottles of wine a day, but at least one. And it better be the right one or you open multiple, but you got to drink what comes really from the soil and what is the purity of the soil. And by the way, look at this grafting tool machine. This is a stapler for grafting. Very difficult to find all what I'm showing you. Look at the scalder. It was used to scalding water on vines to kill the insect. Another barrel hole maker, you know, little pitchers, jabouard, which is great. Fit at the bottom of the barrels. Look at those scalder again, sediment filter. We're almost done, huh? I'm going quickly. But I wanna show you as well, we pay homage 
to Adolf Brun, one of the founder of this beautiful Oakville area, George Yount. So, you know, we honor all those people. Those are really amazing. Those are racking canes. Look at how gorgeous they are. You see? And look at the view again. Here we go. This is the Vacas Mountain. Here you have on the sunset the Maikamas Mountain, which again, we back to the Tokalon Vineyards right there. And then look at that, all the tools. I love this little alambic. I want to use it to distill, but it looks so good in the museum. <laughs> What was the, uh, it looked like a canteen. What was that in the window? Yeah, here, yes. No, in the larger, in the larger picture window, there was something, it looked oh, copper. Oh, here, yes. Yeah, yeah, what the is copper that? Copper sulfate sprayer. I see. that on their back. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. I thought back. it was a, I thought it was a canteen for like rosé, so I could just no, take it to a picnic. A, yeah, well, it could be. <laughs> we'll do whatever. It's the right size for me. You see, this is a bottle corker. When I was younger, you know, my parents started the winery in the living room in Burgundy. So I was preparing the samples. And sorry, here we go. And uh, as I was preparing the samples, I was using that little machine. And it was great because you could do one bottle at a time. You would pinch your finger. You will remember it. But it's, it's great. It's, um, again some of those great things of the past. Look at this, this collection of tools. It's a pumice cutter. So from the wine press, you know how beautiful. You were definitely are. right earlier on. A lot of these things look a little like torture devices. Maybe they could be <laughs> both. Well, we, if we certainly get looted here, we have tools to defend ourselves. <laughs> That's positive. This, the bottle corker, another kind, you see. And again, look at the view. So you are here, the only place, you know, in, in Napa Valley, really, on Highway 29, you can actually order food, have a beer, a soft drinks, a glass of wine, a glass of champagne, and enjoy. This is Highway 29, dear friends. We are blessed with the sunset. Copper templates again. Barrel Hall, Charles Krug again, and this was the Oakville Grocery in 1877 when they built the house. You see the grocery next to it is not yet built, and then it will be built in honor of the wine, 1881. So that was a very quick tour, Barb, but I think the goal was to show you as well a little bit of who we are and what we do in a very different way. You could see how magic it is when you come. We will go from that table to that banquette to that table, and we could try every wine you can think of. We appreciate the tour so much, and we did have a question a little bit ago from Scott about visiting the property. Is it open for business right now, or do people need an appointment, or are we kind of on hold temporarily during the quarantine? Well, we appreciate this question because we've been waiting this moment for, you know, literally 90 days. We are open. All our properties are now officially open. As of Friday, meaning tomorrow, we practice social distancing. We sanitize the tables. We wear gloves. We do all the procedure necessary, but we, we do receive you. Um, I know you're smiling, Barb, because you'd like to see me wearing gloves and a mask, right? I'd prefer you with a mask, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you my mask with a clear... Uh, but yeah, we, we thank you for asking because we are dying to have more people coming, for sure. Uh, you're going to realize we've been orphaned. We're losing Scott. It's that same spot in the house with a signal. That's okay. While he's getting resettled, folks, I want to kind of Back. echo the statement here. And I know we're, I all, just getting, <laughs> we're all just getting used to uh, some restaurants reopening in the Chicagoland area and the suburbs, and it's feeling good to getting things back to 
a little bit of normal and supporting local businesses, but I know a lot of folks in the wine industry in California, especially, and uh, this has been a really hard time. So if you have the means and the time and you can't want to get out and travel, the hospitality industry there could really use you. These are some great people that uh, have had their tasting room shut down and their restaurants shut down. So if you can get out to support them, please do. That means everybody. Uh, in the Napa Valley, but especially Jean Charles properties for today anyway, right? Thank you, yes, we <laughs> thank you, Barb, so much because we've been, uh, honestly, it's been very difficult. I need to confess our business. For us, you know, we rely on fine dining a lot and a lot of uh, the hotels we work with and it has been probably the biggest and most tragic management time I've ever lived in my life from people and we, We've, we've been very honorable to all our teams and employees, but very difficult in terms of uh, seeing what we've observed. So everybody today can help by buying the wines from your store because we love Vinny's. Thank we you. We love Barb, we love Michael, and we love the whole team. And Barbara, the other Barbara. So we're very, very grateful, Barb. Thank you so much for having us with you tonight. Uh, it's oh. a true honor true honor and and i i want to close on saying to all of you let's be very proud and it's a frenchman who tells you that of american history let's be very honored about the great past of america and this is why as we build this museum like the buena vista winery museum we were very honored to put forward the united states of america the know-how the savoir-faire and the great history of making wine for so long with such success. So let's not forget, we, we want to sell a lot of French wines, but we want to promote a lot of American wines too. And we are very, Amen. very proud of it. <laughs> so thank to Barbara's so charm, we're going to have a toast. <laughs> to my charm, I want to thank Dina course. Clark, you know, and Dina Clark, who put some great energy behind this gathering today thank you dina and but really dina because and julia so grateful your whole team has really been a pleasure to work with the last few weeks as we've been arranging the details and thane these wines showed really well today i'm glad some of the people who joined us got to taste along with you and hear about them right and jean charles i don't know what more i can say it's always such a pleasure to see you and spend time with you but before we go I do have to ask you to show us those socks. <laughs> oh, for sure. Well, one, I'm going to show you my jewelry that I'm just wearing. Just the socks, Jean-Charles. I don't... Oh, you just want to see the socks. Look at that. And they are just there they are. socks. You could see that, right? Go down a little. <laughs> yes. There they are. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, if you go out to so Napa... So look at those sexy socks. <laughs> If you visit 1881 Napa, you go to the museum and you I'm bump into Jean Charles. I'm always, so I'm always wearing you. red socks. But I do sincerely want to thank you for the time. I know you've been busy and uh, we're glad all of us are making it through these really challenging times safely and uh, healthy and happy. So thank you for the Cabernets today and for everything you're doing for Napa Valley. Well, and, and, and Barb, we want to thank you. Michael Binstein and the entire Binstein team. We want to thank Heritage. Uh, I know Scott Cohen is on, um, on the line as well with us, as well as Steve Hirsch and our wonderful Heritage distributor and uh, Dina and obviously all our team because families get together like we do and it creates magic. So we thank you for your support. And we want to get the commitment that everybody buys a case each of those wines because we want them to leave your store and get in people's cellar. They need thank it. you. I hope so. And I look forward to trying this 1881 again. This is the 2018 Thank you so much. vintage. We'll see you guys. You take care. Cheers. You Cheers. too. Hola, love. Bye. Au revoir.